Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? This is my final maths related interview. What sort of villain gets that? It's Australia's reaction. It's an exclusive. This is an exclusive. That's hitting the cutting room floor, bro. It caused a lot of drama and they it never got air. It just went nuts. Hello, darling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's always the yeah, yeah for me, man. We's back. We're back in the studio, man. Look, we got a very nice guest in the studio today. We got Nick Thompson. From Love is Blind, season two. Mm-mm. I'm so excited. This was my favorite of all time of that show. So I'm she so says, excited to talk to you. Of all time. No pressure at all, huh? <laughs> <laughs> iconic one. It was dope. It was dope. Also, he's got his own podcast called Eyes Wide Open uh, mm. by Nick Thompson as well and is also part of the UCAN Foundation, which is the Unscripted Cast Advocacy Network. Um, and actually pretty interesting, man, because they mainly focus on people that come from reality TV that feel like maybe they've been exploited. You know what I'm saying? So mm. he's kind of giving those people a bit of a voice. You understand? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I'm actually kind of excited to actually touch so on all excited. that. Before we get into it, once again, we are recording on Gadigal Land. That's very important. And he's coming live from Chicago. You. Just for us. <laughs> hey, let's go. To chat to you. What's up, so boy? So crazy. I'm seeing. I've seen you on my screen, and now you're on my screen again. But I'm actually talking to you, so this is crazy. For real, for real. Because like you were just watching Love Is Blind. You know what I mean? Uh, I love the whole. But your season in particular was my most favorite. I feel like it was the most iconic. It just had the most craziest oh. like love stories, but like fights and just twists and turns. And what I love about Love Is Blind is the the diversity Come with on. all the couples. There's colours and cultures of all sorts but we lack that in Australia Mm -hmm. so much like Taku was the first just in your shows you mean yeah like I was from Married at First Sight and Taku was from Love Island Taku was the first black guy to be cast on Love Island Australia yeah Yeah. really I guess I wouldn't have anticipated that it's crazy hey but I loved yours it's just like the colours of the rainbow (laughs) 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 the whole skittle bag but I loved how the concept of Love is Blind, if anyone hasn't seen it, it's on Netflix. Amazing. It's like the opposite of the show that I was on. So mine was um, Married at First Sight. So you start off at the altar. So I remember your season with the sweat and the suit. Imagine meeting like Danielle. It was so hot. It, yeah, it looked <laughs> it hot. It was so hot. Yeah. <laughs> So my, our show it was like 90 degrees, it, which oh was, I don't know, probably 33, 34. Oh, I okay. felt for you because so you were like so suited up. Did you even have the vest on as well? Like the th- full three piece? I did, I, yeah. which ended up being an extra barrier of sweat <laughs> to oh get through, God. for sweat to get oh, through. Oh, my so. heart felt for you, yeah. How much about that was the heat or was it the nerves, bro? Because I so, like, Well, here, here's the... Here's the thing. Unfortunately, I sweat a lot. I I have like no tolerance. My body doesn't know what to do in the humidity. So the second, I I mean, it could be, it could be like a spring day, but if the humidity is high, I'm going to be sweating outside and everyone else is going to think it's the most beautiful day. (laughs) So I've always been that way. But here's what happened. Mm -hmm. My suit, I believe, was like a wool suit. And then there was not a cloud in the sky to give you a moment break from the sun. (laughs) And then to top it all off, Mm. I knew I was going to sweat. And so then I start sweating and then then the nerves start there where it's like, now I'm sweating a lot. And I've always been a little into a lot insecure about my sweating. And so I'm just like, well, here we go. I guess this is going to be a growing moment for me. (laughs) The whole world's going to see me. Sweating bullets. <laughs> but man, listen, I'm also hot blood, so I actually understand what you mean. I always got to carry a washcloth with me everywhere. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> listen, man, so were you a lover of uh, uh, Love is Blind? You know what I mean? Like before getting on? I had never really watched much reality TV. I had seen one season of The Bachelor, which I, I didn't even watch the whole thing, but I, I yeah. watched parts of it because we were doing one of those tournament brackets at work, and I wanted to be oh, a part yeah. of that. Yeah, so that was the only time. And then when they actually recruited me off of LinkedIn to come into the casting process, that's when I was like, oh, I heard a lot of people really loved this show during Mm. COVID lockdowns. And so I went back and watched it um, after agreeing to take, you know, an initial meeting to learn what was going on. And so I decided after watching season one, I was like, oh, you know, this kind of addresses a lot of my issues with dating these days. And I, I think this maybe can work. Like, maybe this concept can work. But I was also, through the whole casting process, which for me was from November 2020 um, until end of March, early April, when I was told I was part of the cast. Um, And I had just come to terms at that point where if I do this, if I get cast, 
I'm going to go on with an open mind, mm. but I'm not going to be upset if I go home the first day because I don't connect with anyone. It would be an amazing experience uh, mm. that is ex- right outside my com- like not right, very outside my comfort zone. Yeah. So it, it was a growth opportunity. And then at the same time, I'm like, if I do find someone and this works, and then I you know fall in love and I get married, wow, what a what an amazing. Yeah turn of events yeah so i that mindset was really important for me to have Mm -hmm. especially considering the kind of show at least i thought it was uh going into it so it it was yeah it was it was not really on my radar until i was reached out to wow just to give people that the listeners a bit of content like you guys are put into these pods and you can't see the other person and you get to know them through the course of time and i want to know what is that course of time is it a week if you like you You were all in after day two. I remember you were sitting there like you were watching your favorite (laughs) footy game, like right up against the wall. You were on the floor, like your body language was just all in. Like how long is that process to get to know your person? So you're you're in the pods 10 days. um, Oh my God. And everybody, big, big tea drop here. But like I did not propose on day two or day three or whatever they made it look like. It was, it. it was a, yeah. It was at the end, but what did happen at the um, at the onset was Danielle and I connected right away. Mm. And the first round you go, you date everyone for about seven minutes, and you just cycle through them. It's like super so quick, speed and it's dating. almost yeah. It's like I was gonna say it's almost like a speed yeah. dating, but like on steroids because you have <laughs> to make decisions yes. to eliminate people and keep people based on a seven minute conversation. Mm. But there was something between Danielle and I that clicked kind of like right in that seven yeah. minutes, and it helped her in my book anyway, stand out to me yeah. as someone that I like, wow, I really want to talk to her again. Yep. And as time went on, we we just kind of had this sense of when it was going to be each other in the pods because you don't know. You just know mm-hmm. what time you're going into them. You don't know who you're going to talk to. Mm-hmm. And um, right, right around day three or four, um, she and I had a conversation where she, you know, she was saying, I'm not really feeling anybody else. It's you or, or go home. I don't want to ruin this for you. I want you to continue through the process. And I had kind of already decided mm-hmm. for the most part. Um, yep. There was someone else I was talking to, but when push came to shove, I was just also trying to let the experiment play out, yeah. um, which is something, you know, you get that pep talk every morning from from the producers where like, mm-hmm. let it play out. Don't yep. hone in on one person. You could find out one thing and it could change everything because of the nature of the experiment and the speed at which these relationships are happening. Mm-hmm. But you know what, man? Like that's just the craziest thing about being like in these experiments because, um, not to bag out any producers or anything, but it's like I think our intuition speaks very, very loud. You know what I mean? And you know who that person mm-hmm. is when you meet him. You understand? And then now when you get another opinion that's coming in saying, no, 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 like this is the experiment. You know what I'm saying? Like just you know, stay in it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's kind of conflict. You know what I mean? Like, and you you're kind of fighting like an internal battle. Did you feel like they kind of influenced your decision a little bit? So. Ironically, for all the critiques I have of this whole show in the world of reality TV, the honest truth is they didn't really mess with me or my thought process much Mm. at all, Mm. or her from what I could tell. In fact, since we connected so quick and it was so genuine, I at one point even asked my producer, I'm like, hey, am I doing this right? Like, you're not talking to me or interacting with me like you are with the other people. And her response was, no, you're doing it exactly right. And that's why I don't have to interact with you. So then when we would get those, you know, sort of pep talks to say, hey, don't let this this experiment, you know, get be ruined because you focus on one person too soon, too quick. I always thought they were kind of talking to us, but it I never got like a personal conversation like that. And I think it was because everyone actually saw there was a genuine connection and they decided not to to really interfere in that, at least up until that point later. Wow, man, that's beautiful, man, because you know what? A lot of times, you know, like I think, like both me and Selena can say, you, you you kind of end up developing somewhat of a relationship with these producers. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and just like, <laughs> they're kind of like, you know, your counselor, I guess, in a way. And it's kind of messed up when you think about it because, uh, I, I actually hate to say this, they kind of act like they care. Yeah. 
<laughs> about what you're talking oh, about. Yeah. You know, we all know that. And I don't I you know, I do think there's a level of care that they yeah. have as as a human, but I also mm-hmm. think they have a job to do mm-hmm. and part of that is maybe maybe um caring in, in a way that they can leverage that relationship later. Mm. Yeah, I was so naive to that. Yeah. I, I was a sucker. I was like best friends with my producer. Or well, so I thought. Oh my god. <laughs> Until she goes how to how me did after that the show. <laughs> Okay, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Hey, do you want to catch up for what? a coffee?" Like radio silence. <laughs> oh. Is that is that actually so, a true story? Yeah, I got her a present and everything after like after filming. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god but she man. said thank and then, you yeah okay and that's i was good, like would you that. like to catch up for a coffee nothing and i was like okay i understand she's got a job to I, do yeah. they all do that's true but yeah she put you on do not disturb yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. my man so with danielle so she said that there was a point in which she had to change producers right when y'all went to mexico and that kind of you know messed up you know, kind of like her spirit in a way, because like she had a relationship with the original producer, mm-hmm. and then now she had somebody that was a little bit more, you know, more intense, a little bit more pushy. Did you have the same experience as well? Yeah. So we each had. Um, so everyone gets an individual producer that they kind of work with before the show, that they work with during the show, yeah. and then when you get together, obviously you get a couple's producer. Mm-hmm. So. What happened with, I believe, all of the other couples that were on our season, I think all of them, they actually got a producer that had worked at least on the show the whole time, if not necessarily Mm -hmm. both of those in the couple. They actually brought in someone from another show, pulled him out of that show, and brought Uh... him uh, to Mexico to start working with us then. And I've heard that there were like people that ever, like everyone kind of wanted to produce us because we were going to be like a good love story mm-hmm. um and then he came in and I, I remember him saying and this this is the part where i was like well this isn't gonna work in, in this type of environment was where he yeah. said he didn't know anything about our relationship and he hadn't seen any of the footage so he was going to kind of learn about it by basically being around us um which you know i i don't when you're in that type of environment if you're actually if your goal is actually to promote a healthy loving mm. relationship that ends in marriage to prove the concept is is accurate someone sh- that producer should really know the origins of your relationship mm-hmm. because everything's happening so quick mm-hmm. and so i felt like that was i felt like we were almost immediately in situations um that we wouldn't have been in in mm-hmm. real life or maybe wouldn't have been in if we had someone that had followed us in the pods mm-hmm. As a viewer, that made complete sense hearing that now because I just felt like your relationship was like love story and then it it would be like the sandwich effect. It would be like good, bad, and then good. Like you would have these blow up fights and I'm like, where where did that even come from? And then the next thing you'll be like, oh, hugging them back together. Yeah. Yeah. That makes so much sense now. I will also say too, a lot of the stuff, so this is where I'm like, you know, this is like very manufactured in a lot of ways mm-hmm. because we had things going on in our personal life that were pretty intense um yeah during probably like the last two or three weeks yep. when we were back here in in chicago and we weren't allowed to like handle those um you know she had a, an issue in her family where someone was um in severe need of of family um my dad's dog passed away and my dad is like Older man, single man, all he has is his dog. He was devastated by it. And instead of, you know, handling these situations and learning how to support one another and what we need Mm. in those situations, which is what you would do with someone you're engaged with, right? Instead, we were sitting there having cake tastings and talking about student loans. And it's it's all this stuff where it was like we our heads weren't in it. And we had more serious stuff going on sometimes than what we were the situations or scenes we were put in. So you're just kind of on edge in a different kind of way. Yeah, I can totally relate. And then they just fill you up with so much alcohol. Well, that's what happened in my season. Because I noticed those like gold goblets. What's up with those? Yeah, it's twofold. I think you know the the first one is they don't they don't want the continuity issue of trying to put an edit together with Uh, changing cup levels but the other one is that they have become sort of iconic with the love is blind brand to the point where (laughs) i want one (laughs) yeah you see posters now and it's just love is blind and the gold goblet (laughs) i feel like something as well that uh, was so interesting about hearing the whole story and um i guess mainly the drama you know like that would happen on scene is i i would say 40 percent is what happens on the scene but the rest of that is what happens you know like at the crib like because like you guys were saying that you were in apartments where you know 
you'd get in and you don't have the key to go out. You know what I'm saying? So like the conditions are already crazy. So you in your mind, like you're already kind of stressed out about, you know, how you're going to get water or food. Talk to me about those conditions, if you don't mind me asking. Yeah, so that was mostly when we were in Mexico mm. uh, and prior to that in the pods. So we would film 16, 18, 20 hours a day in the pods. And that we're, we're not actually staying. That's a set. So that lounge, that's a set. I Sorry to ruin it and burst everyone's bubble. Uh, but we stayed at a hotel that was probably 20, 20 minute drive away. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> when you get there, they take all your stuff. So you don't have your, your wallet, you don't have your credit cards, you don't have any money, you don't have any IDs, mm-hmm. you don't have your passport. And then you're you're put in a hotel room for a few days before you start filming and then a few days before you go to Mexico and then a few days um, when you get back from Mexico, but that time you're, you're with your partner. And um, you're not given hotel keys. So you can't leave. And if you do leave, you have to go to a producer and get the key. Oh. And then they know you left. Oh. And then, you know, you're subject to blah, 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 whatever the contract states from a from a, a, a damages perspective, if they send you all this crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. So that part right there, like you, you kind of get in your head and you get isolated. It's almost like solitary confinement mm-hmm. where you're just you're just stuck in this room and, you know, there's a little bit of light, but it's a hotel room. So it's not a lot of light. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, um, or a lot of space to move. And I'm six foot five. I could like, I think I could reach up and touch the ceiling. So it's like (laughs) almost, yeah, a little more claustrophobic for me than maybe some others. But um, yeah, so that that part's very isolating. And then when you get to Mexico, you're you're quarantining in Mexico for a few days. Uh, Again, similar situation. You had a little more freedom to like go to the gym and stuff Mm -hmm. in that hotel. But, uh, you know, you're really kind of stuck at their behest and where they want to take you and what they want to let you do. Mm. It'll kind of make you feel a certain way, right? Because it's like you kind of, you know, isolated like in this room and then all of a sudden you have to like code switch, you know what I mean? And be this, you know, person that's got the stage presence. You know what Mm. I'm saying? I would agree completely. I think where it really got to me, well, first of all, I'm, I'm an active person, like just walking my dog before we started this, right? Mm -hmm. I try to to move around, like being outside in nature gives me, you know, peace. It, it calms my mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, so th- a lot of that was hard to, to do during this process. So just overall, I think that has its toll on you. Physically, I lost 15 pounds in the 10 days in the pods in mm-hmm. the Mexico trip yep. in three weeks. And you can, you can kind of tell, yeah, or I can that. tell anyway. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so those things definitely impact you. Mm-hmm. But what what really sticks out to me, for me personally, is so you date someone for nine days. You get engaged. If you mm-hmm. get engaged, you get to see them for the first time for 20, 25 minutes the next day. Uh, then yeah. you don't see them or talk to them again for days. Yeah. yeah, And you're just sitting there gaslighting yourself. And I'm like, okay, maybe she didn't think I was attractive. What if she didn't think I'm attractive? Well, what's going to happen now if we get together in Mexico and something is off? What am I going to do then? Am I going to be hard? So then I start putting up walls. I'm like, well, you know, forget that. Like, then that's not the person I want to be with anyway. So then yep. she's not who I thought she was. And you just kind of mm-hmm. like go through this rabbit hole in your yeah. head while you're isolated with your own thoughts and not able to talk to the person you just got engaged with and was able to see for 20, 25 minutes. Oh my God, was 20. that because uh, everyone had their own unique like little story when you guys first mm-hmm. met and locked eyes? Was that weird? Because you've obviously heard each other's voices. You've got to know each other over like less than two weeks. Was that it's first weird, be- weird? It's weird because you're sitting there and there's, I mean, this is a massive set. I, yeah. I, I, I've like, I haven't worked into Hollywood movies, but I've done some independent film work. I wanted to be a filmmaker, so I know how it works. I am still amazed when I think about the size and the scope of these sets. Yeah, it looks right? huge. Yeah, so for me, we're sitting there and there's, so there's going to be tech challenges, right? There's like 20 camera people and sound people sitting out there, you know, on the other side of the set waiting for this. Yeah. So there's tech issues. So it's like, okay, we're ready to go. And then it's like, no, we're not. We got to do something with the sound and the lighting's out, whatever it might be. Yeah. And so you're sitting in this room and you just see their shadow and yeah. then they walk away and then they come back and then you, you see it again <laughs> and then you walk away. And so you're just sitting there back and forth yeah. and you're just sitting like what when is this door gonna open and how am i actually gonna feel once i see them because you know this is stressful this is very stressful but it was really it was it was funny because as soon as the door opened you know we just ran to each other and it's awkward because you you don't know what you're supposed to do (laughs) yeah do i hug you do i kiss you (laughs) right and so i had planned to propose again in in this time like in real life Mm -hmm. right 
which would be the third time because I actually did a trial run with her. That this didn't oh. get aired, but I did a trial run the day before her proposal. Yeah. So yeah, I sent her a, a ring pop and said, "Let's oh, run through this oh, so there's yes. no surprises yeah, yeah, tomorrow." Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. What's crazy about the whole like my show was married at first sight, but my marriage wasn't legally binding, whereas yours was, yes. wasn't it? Yeah. Did you guys yeah. know that? <clears throat> signing on to the show yes so uh, i did know about yours because i had Alyssa from married at first yes. sight uh last yes. season on my podcast mm-hmm. and she told me it wasn't legally binding yeah. which was a surprise because ours was yeah. like the week before our wedding we had to go down in a courthouse with our producer and sign a marriage license That's and then crazy. as soon as you know you say yes that minister is like basically i feel like he turns around and just signs it <laughs> So yeah, it's legally it's a legally binding. And you marriage. knew that before, like signing onto the show. Yes, yeah, wow. that is something that is very clear. Yeah. Um, and there's like guidelines around all of that too. Damn, that's crazy. You would have needed some major cojones, man, to just go on there knowing that you know maybe the person that I might be with might not be the one that I'm with for the rest of my life. You know what yeah. I mean? Like it's a major contract, man. Because to be honest, and me, that's what I'm not, I yeah, I'm not sure if I would have done mine if I knew if it was going to be yeah. legally scared, man. Binding. Yeah, you know what the the thing that I thought of because I did think about that and the, the way that I positioned it in my head was I'm not going to do something that I'm not sure of, mm-hmm. and it and I've kind of changed my mindset going through all of this too, where you know it's it's um you know you got to take that you got to be willing to take that leap of faith if you're going to take the opportunity seriously now Absolutely. i know the show is very popular it's the most watched show in the world from a reality unscripted perspective mm-hmm. so i get that and i i know now that means it's going to attract some different types of people right yeah. you know, clout chasers yeah. people that are are there for disingenuous reasons mm-hmm. whatever but you know, I, I, I realized I had to be willing to take a chance. And that was mm-hmm. stepping out of my comfort zone because I'm a very, very methodical with the decisions that I yes. make in my career and my life and my finances. Um, you know, I, I'm very measured and I'm very methodical mm-hmm. and I take my chances when I when they're the most likely to pay off. So this was that was part of me stepping out of mm-hmm. my mm-hmm. comfort zone. But the other thing is I always tell people, you know, and, and I. I don't, don't want to say coach because I don't make any money from it, but like I advise some people that reach out through my foundation or directly to me and I advise them. I'm like, you know, you just got to be willing to realize that you're going to have to take a chance either way, but mm-hmm. be aware that that person that's there on the other side of that wall or across from you on the altar, if you get there, you have to be really sure they're there for the the same yeah. reasons as you yeah. because otherwise you're not, you're going to be misaligned coming out of the gate and that's going to be where the challenge is. Wow. Because imagine going through this, meeting someone you think is your person, and that person turns out to be there for the clout. And in that moment, they decide, I'm going to say yes, because this is going to be more financially beneficial Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. more fame for me Mm -hmm. as a married couple. Or if they're like planning to leave whoever at the altar all along. Yeah. And then you've Mm -hmm. just put yourself into this situation. So you've got to, you've just got to like think about all of the factors mm. and all the potential data points. Man, and that's the hardest thing, man, because it's like here you are, you're trying to go into this experiment, so to say, with an open mind and an open heart without really trying to overthink every single possible situation yes. that might go wrong. You understand? Mm-hmm. And I always say to people, I'm like, the only thing that you can actually control is just your emotions and just yourself in general because whatever happens outside of that, you're just backing yourself 100% and hoping that other person has got the right intention. You understand? Mm-hmm. So that's, so well that, man, like that would have been like the hardest thing for you. But I think something that I actually wanted to ask, like, you know, off the back of that question would be, the back to reality moment. Okay, so we usually, you know, like to talk about these moments. Well, the name of the show is Back to Reality. <laughs> what was your mm-hmm. back to reality moment, man? And how was it like after, you know, after shooting? I've had several back wow. to reality. I'm like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> it's almost, it's like, it's like when you have that dream, right? And you wake yeah. up and you think, oh, okay, I'm okay. And then you're actually in the dream still. Yeah. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like that. I think my first um, back to reality moment was the day after the show. Uh, the fit filmed, not came out mm-hmm. when all of a sudden they were all gone. There was no one telling me where to go every day yeah. or telling us where to go every day, what we were going to talk about every day. Mm. And then, you know, the distraction of work before that. So you're never really like too clear yeah. uh, on your mind. And when they dropped us back into reality and we, you know, we had a little bit of stuff of uh, items that we wanted to do together. So the first night we had planned to go to this restaurant that we both or she hadn't been to and I really loved. 
Uh, so we planned that. We went that. But it was so hard to mm. to plan what we were going to do and how we, what our timeline for things was going to be because you, you don't know what it's like to just live free, mm. married to someone yep. after a few weeks where you, you're trying to integrate your lives together, but you're also trying to integrate family and friends and expectations. And, you know, you all have expectations going into a relationship. Mm -hmm. And usually you you work towards a marriage or you know, even exclusivity before the marriage by taking these steps together. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like we were, no pun intended, you know, blind and put into the steps, right? Yeah. And they may not have been the steps that we would have taken should we have met in an organic way. So we just, that was my first back to reality moment. Mm -hmm. The next back to reality moment was um, when two of my best friends said, Nick, we're not saying you're different because you're still you, but like, you have stopped prioritizing your friends before the show and you spend all your time with your friends from the show. Right. And it wasn't a, and it was like a, a check for me to be like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm not, and I have six friends. It's not like it's a process to spend time mm -hmm. with all yeah. of them. We usually all do it together. Right. But yep. that was a moment that really clicked for me that the summer after the show came out where I was kind of like, wow, I'm, I'm actually hurting the people that are my reality, yeah. right? Yes. In exchange to go do what, you know? And, and I, I have no issues. Um, I, I choose not to hold any grudges or anything or, or any negative feelings towards anyone from the show, but like they weren't my people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Like we became connected, right? We became bonded. We went through this in, insane experience yeah. together, but they weren't my people. Mm -hmm. And in, the next, the reason that that is so much is because I feel at best when I'm with my people because I've done so much work mm -hmm. to make sure I'm surrounded by my people. Exactly. Yeah. Because there was a long time when I wasn't. Mm. There was a long time when I would give so many calories to people that would just take and take and I would, yes. I would get nothing in return. Yep. And so I learned all of this over the last five, six years through therapy and removing people not meant for me and putting up boundaries around people mm. that I like that were important to me, but I couldn't handle on a regular basis and you know sometimes i'm sure it happened the other way so for me it was kind of like wow i spent so much time getting here and now i'm going to leave that to go back into an environment that isn't really comfortable for me mm -hmm. um and I, ha I, didn't, I didn't ever have interest in being a celebrity i don't i don't really um i don't really aspire to that i aspire to people to think and talk about ideas not people not you know watching it and stuff like that so it's it was really difficult for me to hear that but it was a reality check moment for mm -hmm. me and then the the last time i would say was after um so my divorce leaked from tmz uh, a few days after i was served i didn't tell my fan it all happened very quickly i didn't tell my family or all of my friends um so that leaked and i wake up on a sunday morning to missed calls text messages the news outlets wanting interviews and i'm just like i barely processed that we're not spending the rest of our lives together mm -hmm. i don't i, I can't explain everything to everyone yeah. you know so that was to me that was like okay this is i'm gonna be doing this in the public eye and it just started there and it segued for like or i guess not segued it, it barreled for two months ish in which that two months i obviously was filed you know served for divorce mm -hmm. i had lost my job i had been smeared in the media i had been um, hearing, you know, people from the show talking negatively about me and my relationship, people in, in on uh, the internet were, were speculating and spreading rumors that I cheated, that all this stuff. And it was just all these things coming at me. And it felt like the world was a freight train. And I finally had a, a realization that I needed to step away from this at the end of last year. Mm -hmm. And I needed to, to get back to my reality because yeah. in, unless I'm around my friends, unless I'm around my family, unless I'm around the kind of people that I, I need to be around to feel lit up, to of feel course. energy, yeah. I'm just going to continue to be sucked into this world of all this mm -hmm. excessive drama and people commentating on yeah. me that don't even know me. Yes. And that wasn't, for and of course I end up stepping back into it, but that wasn't for me, right? Yeah. That wasn't for me at that time. I needed to heal mm -hmm. and I needed to heal myself and I needed to prioritize what I needed to do to get back to the state I was in before the show. Mm -hmm. Cause I had I had hit rock bottom, went off social media for over a week, just didn't even mm -hmm. open it, deleted the apps, stayed out of it, and just started to think, what do I need to rebuild myself? And it was I need to get back to my reality. 
Wow. 100%. Did you make any good friends off the show? Um, you still keep in touch with any of them? I, I have some casual friendships. Um, I'll exchange texts with Shane every now and then. Um, I'm, I'm yep. friends with Jeremy Hartwell, who I started the UCAN Foundation mm-hmm. with, mm-hmm. which is the Unscripted Cast Advocacy Network. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was gone after a few days of the show, but you know that's the thing with these shows. It, your experience is your experience, and you can't let anyone else tell you what it was or tell yeah. you what it should have been. And um, you know, I know he had some some really big challenges that he's overcome since coming out of that as well. So we kind of stayed friends um, through the time, and this this whole UCAN Foundation has brought us even closer together. My man, this is actually what I wanted to hear was, do you think your relationship with Danielle would have flourished if you guys had met on the outside? It would have been different. Yeah. Um, do I, I think there would have been, I think there just would have been more time in between these things that created such hyper um, mental states for both of us. Mm-hmm. And I think that, the organic nature of that and the you know slow roll of a relationship instead mm-hmm. of the barreling down a, mm. a hill, I think we would have been able to identify potential challenges and worked on them one at a time as they came up instead of Absolutely. coming out of a predetermined um, you know seven weeks where you don't really have any very much real life interaction and real life experiences with each other. Wow. So I think it would have just presented more of a of an opportunity. Um, you know, she and I recently reconnect, well not recently anymore, like 5 months ago, reconnected on my podcast and talked through all of this and we both agree that if we if we would have had the time and we would have had the tools that we probably probably would have had a completely different relationship. And whether that works out or not, or worked out or not, who knows, right? Yeah. I, I can't put a genie in a bottle, but I think we would have had a, a completely different experience and that mm-hmm. could have yielded different results. Absolutely. But at least what you can be proud of is you went in there with, you know, good intention. Yeah. Most and I will say I'm, I am most proud of myself for staying true to myself. Come on. Man. Now I had moments like I shared where it was oh, you know, you're you're spending too much time with them. Like you're not, you're missing key things that we do all the time together and all of this stuff. Um, so, you know, taking that aside, like I never acted out of character. Mm-hmm. I don't look back and think, oh man, that was out of character. I really shouldn't have done that. Mm-hmm. And I think that's um, that's something I'm really proud of because this is a, a experience and an industry that wants you to change and it wants to force you to change and it wants to almost bribe you with fame to change. Yeah. And I didn't change. I stayed true to myself. And I, I really saw that. That's why I was really confused after the aftermath of the show as to how much like hate you were copying. Like, where did that even <laughs> all come or stem from? The nature of being on a show where the whole world's watching you and is going to have judgments and, and ideas about your relationship. But... Mm-hmm. If I'm being honest, as time's gone on and I've really experienced a lot of love and a lot of hate, I realize like trying to do the right thing and helping people can be very polarizing for some reason in the society that we live in. But, um, you know, I, I think sometimes it's it's projecting. People are projecting uh, their feelings about themselves or how they would have done in this situation mm. differently, and they project that onto people. And then I also think there's just... Um, there's a little bit of a level of jealousy that, you know, you got to do this and you did it this way. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I should have got that opportunity and I would be able to handle it and I would be able. So I think there's, there's those two things really coming together. But I also just think, cause I am, I'm genuine, like who you talk to here is who you talk to. If you knew me, you know, for years or the same person you talked to, if you ran into me in in the grocery store, which happened earlier today. Right. So, I think people sometimes don't know what to do with that. Mm-hmm. They're used to to people. So many people are grifters now, right? So many mm-hmm. people behave one way in one setting and another way in another. And yes. I, I'm just not like that. Yep. And I think that that's honestly just hard for people to. And again, this is a lot of work. This is a lot of therapy. This is a lot of growing up. Mm-hmm. This is a lot of healing, you know, past trauma. Um, this is a lot of me spending so much time figuring out what my values are and learning how to stick to them. So it hasn't been easy. It's not like I'm perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm far from it, but I know who I am and I can be confident in that. And I think that's, that's a little difficult sometimes if, if you don't experience that yourself. Mm. Most definitely, man. And I like what you just said before, man, about, you know, how like people can 
kind of be like shapeshifters a little bit. You know what I mean? And there's something to be said about those people that are just true to themselves. You know what I mean? And I think yeah. you were definitely one of those people. And um, is, is is that kind of part of a reason as to why you started the UCAN Foundation, Unscripted Cast Advocacy Network, for those people that you feel like have been portrayed in a light that is unjust? That's a big reason. Yeah, I think there there were two real factors for me. Um, as I said, like once I stepped away from it at the end of last year and I, I started, I, I stopped listening to, you know, my agent or PR mm -hmm. people saying, do this, don't do yep. this. And and not that I really listened to them, but it added pressure, oh, right? Yeah, so I would double, double, right. And like one of the things I, is I love to talk about politics and cultural issues mm -hmm. and all that stuff. And you know, my PR people the first day were like, don't talk about that, yeah. it's too divisive. I'm like, yep. okay. You know, things like that. Or or I like to talk about mental health. And they're like, great, keep it high level. Don't get too serious because you're gonna turn people off. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, well, I like to make a lot of my own products. I make my own soaps, I make my own cleaners, toothpaste. I make my own condiments. I want to know the toothpaste thing. Yeah. What was up with that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, is that why you're I've been making are so my own white? look how straight I, and white this teeth are. Like, Let's so. just say my dentist and I never have a conversation negative about my teeth. It's a keep doing what you're doing, maybe floss a little more. So wow. come on, okay. I'm doing this for ten years. Wait, <laughs> how did we just go from you can to teeth? <laughs> no, that, that scene stuck with me. I don't know why. Because Nick makes his who makes their own toothpaste. I know, but it's I know. So strange, but so I do. cool. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, going off. Track. So, with, sorry, with the UCAN Foundation, as I stepped away and I, I stopped trying to be an influencer or be a public figure, and I just was like, I'm going to be me again. Like, this is where I'm comfortable. Mm -hmm. yep. I started to really, and I'm, I'm a reflector, I'm a thinker. I'm like, mm -hmm. what went wrong? What could I have done better? How can I take this forward and do better next time? That's how I think. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> as I started doing that, I was like, how am I supposed to act different when? I don't have mental health support aside from my own therapist who is living it in real time with me, right? How am I supposed to come out of this situation married without help from a counselor or without help from, you know, any real, any real, anyone on the show with like, here's how you do this. We have a blueprint or we have recommendations and they do, they give you like some very high level recommendations, mm -hmm. but they don't actually like give you the tools. And so that's where I, I kind of was like, wait a minute, okay, this is an issue. And I saw what it did to Danielle. I saw what it did to me or experienced what it did to me. And then I experienced what it did to our relationship. Mm -hmm. And to reflect on how much this hurt both of us, mm -hmm. it, was, it was obvious to me that like there's a huge gap here. And then the legal thing, these contracts, you both know, these contracts, mm -hmm. they own you. Yeah. They own everything about you. They own they own your story. You don't even have the ability to tell your own story the way you experienced it. Yeah. So these contracts, it's like, what's are these legal? What's mm -hmm. le like? What's legal about someone saying they can defame you? That's yeah. illegal. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's like, can you sign away these rights? So I started really thinking about all of this stuff, and um, you know, Jeremy had been talking to me, my co-founder, about this foundation. And he wanted it to, he was, he was very like straightforward with the legal stuff. And I'm like, I'm bored listening to you talk about it. Like, I know we, I know we need it yeah. and I know people need that legal advice, but like what we see, what we needed when we left immediately was mental health help. Wow. Like we just needed help. We needed, and you know, he, he used his psychologist. I had been working with my therapist, but those resources aren't readily available. So the foundation is there to pair you up with the resources you need pre, during, and post show so that you can prepare yourself, you know your rights, and you know how to, how to say no, and you know what to expect as best as you can because I do argue until you go through it, you have no idea what you're getting into. You, you can think it, you can hear someone tell you, but how you experience it is going to be completely unique to anyone else. Mm -hmm. So I thought we needed that, and I thought we needed someone to advocate for change in this industry because... And I know this now because I've talked to people across the entire world from The Circle, Married at First Sight, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Fuckboy Island, other shows similar to the one that I was on, competition shows, cooking shows, 
all of them and there's so many stories and they're all the same they're all exploitative they are all physically and mentally damaging everybody's working outside of any modern labor laws and so i was like we need someone to advocate Mm -hmm. we need someone that's going to pull these levers to get industry change Mm -hmm. so that we can actually move forward and catch up reality tv production with the way that we conduct all entertainment Mm -hmm. right so there needs to be breaks. There needs to be hours, uh, you know, regulations around your labor hours. There needs to be mental health services that are independent from these productions that have your, as the individual's best interest in mind. We need legal or we need contracts that are not 100% one-sided toward production, that you have control over your likeness, that you have maybe residual pay, that you have access to these basic resources considering the the um you know the entertainment being extracted from your mm. your labor and your existence man i like that man and you know what the, like the mission statement really sums up everything that you just said which is so important you said that we provide mental health and legal support to past current and future reality tv cast members my question to that is what well, is 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 that just for uh reality tv contestants just in the us or does that also you know or like do you guys also provide that support to people like us we're right now we're focused on the us but mm-hmm. we want to be everywhere right we okay. we have someone in the uk that we're speaking with like how can we just duplicate this there and make another branch the challenge is when you look at mental health and legal it's here it's state by state it's different in every country every country has different laws every country has different labor practices so what we're trying to do right now is is we're trying to make a blueprint that we can duplicate mm-hmm. To make sure that we're covering other people we almost have people from all 50 states here um and then we have you know sent kind of surrogates with the message that we're trying to help out in other areas that being said we do um we do have plenty of of other resources from around the globe that we can do our best we just don't have the plethora of resources that we have in the united states at this time and like have you seen like a lot of the cast members from other shows come forward as well apart from you know love is blind Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of them are scared to speak, but mm-hmm. like I said, we've we've combined talked to over a hundred cast members at the That's foundation. I've talked to fifty, sixty myself. I've got two more scheduled this week, including someone who was a producer oh, on a show wow. and had a mental breakdown while on the show and mm-hmm. like left reality TV. Um, so there's all sorts of people that we're we're hearing from, and what what we're trying to do what i'm trying to do is create a environment from a legal perspective where people can speak their truth because if you you know you go through this and you're misrepresented Mm -hmm. it will ruin your life absolutely people i've talked to people who've lost their businesses yeah i've talked to people whose kids have been harassed i've talked to people that got doxxed and harassed to the point where they had to move Mm-hmm. I've heard people had to film after they were sexually assaulted. People who had to film after they were uh, physically ill had infections from bug bites. You name it. Oh my God. I've heard it. Wow. And I know I haven't even heard all of it or anything yeah. close. And it's an industry-wide thing. Like This isn't about my show. This mm-hmm. isn't even about that production company. This is bigger than Netflix. This is an industry-wide phenomenon mm-hmm. of an industry that has escaped regulatory labor practices Mm -hmm. and can basically conduct these games uh, or these shows like it's the hunger games and then everybody's lining up to watch these things and watch these people just be totally damaged from a mental physical and oftentimes public um public uh image perspective wow well said man that that is that is beautiful man like and i really love hearing (laughs) you know like people talk about something that's very, very close to their heart, man. Like, cause this sounds like it's actually something you're very passionate about. And, you know, like even like me, like reading about after you came back from the show when, you know, you were kind of struggling to find a job as well. That was so sad for me, man, yeah. because it's like, if a show can ruin your entire life like that, man, like, is it even worth it? Well, I didn't even get a bad edit. That's I know. That's, that's, that's a thing. Crazy My, thing. You know. Yeah. What happened to me is I, you know, I, I had some negative headlines, whatever it was, I, you know, that contributed to me losing my job, but it wasn't everything. But what, what changed is people were scared to, to bring me on if they were, I've worked primarily in startups for the, the best parts of my career. They're afraid to bring me on and have, you know, their company associated with my name when they're trying to fundraise, when they're trying to, um, you know, uh, make a name for themselves, grow their brand awareness. And, you know, as a, a marketing executive, I'm the face of a lot of things. I'm the evangelist. I'm the one that's out there in the public speaking about our company, about our software, about our products, uh, talking to analysts who make decisions that that 
you know, will they or won't they recommend us? All of those types of things. And now I answer questions about that as a whole separate part of the interview process, which is something that I would never have to do if I didn't go on the show. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I do it well. Other times they're, they're just like, we can't risk it, you know, or, or, or sometimes they just decide after thinking they don't, that's not the direction they want to go. And it, it's all, you know, I don't blame the show, despite what you may read in the headlines. I don't blame the show. Mm-hmm. I blame the experience. The experience is contributing to this situation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I've i never had to have those interviews before the show. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. After this whole experience and the movement that you're trying to create, have you watched <laughs> Love is Blind or any form of reality TV shows now since then? I watched... Well, um, perfect match because Shane was on it yes and I promised him that I would watch it and let him know how I thought he did um other than that I I can't watch it yeah it's too it's triggering for me but it's triggering for the stories that I've heard and it's like I can't I can't sit down and watch this and know that I'm watching something that isn't real yeah and highly knowing the the, Yeah. yeah and the way that people are just getting slandered all over the internet and getting slammed for things that they maybe didn't even say in that context. Yep. It's just hard to watch it once you go through it and once you hear so many Absolutely. stories. Absolutely, I can relate to that so badly. Can I ask one yeah. thing about, I know we always talk about villain edits and stuff, but Shake, <laughs> was he really <laughs> that way? Because I know like at the reunion, Nick Lachey, everyone actually, everyone went off at him. And he just like couldn't see what he was doing was wrong. You know, I got to say two things. I would have answered this differently two months ago. Okay. But um, Shake is unapologetically Shake. Yep. And I, I think, I don't think he necessarily knows sometimes the things that he's saying or doing are hurtful to others. Um, I had had a couple conversations with him. Uh, before the the airing of the sh- the show, mm-hmm. because we would be in group settings and he would say or do things, and I kind and I knew what had happened on the show, and I was kind of like, you know, I, I don't think he's I don't think he's coming from a bad place. I just don't know if he necessarily understands that sometimes what he thinks is funny hurts someone else, yeah. and it's not funnier than it is than it is you know when it hurts someone. Um, but I will say this. When the stories came out about me and my job struggles, he's the only person that texted me from the whole show oh, wow. to say, I hope you keep your head up. I know we've had our differences. I know this has to be hard. Keep your head up. You'll get it figured out. Oh, my God. And, Thank you for sharing you know, while, that. Yeah. And I, I haven't really shared that because I do feel like, you know, it, it maybe it, it, I didn't like him for a long time. Yeah. And then I that, and I'm like, did. maybe my initial, yeah, my initial <laughs> take on him was, you know, he doesn't mean harm. Yep. And I do. I try very hard. Like one of the things I've learned is if I judge people by their intentions and not mm-hmm. their actions, I can yep. be much more forgiving and show much more grace. Mm-hmm. So it kind of reminded me like I don't think he's trying to deliberately hurt people. Yep. I think it's just an output of of what he does. And yeah. so, you know, the fact that he was the only one while well, everyone else has commentary on it and he takes the time to text me. Yeah, that I think that lot. says a lot about character yeah. you know, overall. As a to, massive fan of the show, that has be. completely changed my whole perception of him. Okay. So thank you. <laughs> well, I'm glad. It, it did of me too. It yeah. did of me too. And when I saw that, I was like, you know, that is kinder than a lot of other people. Oh, so definitely. I'll take that. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Nick, I've got one more question, man, before we wrap up. What piece yeah. of advice would you give anyone that's looking to get into reality TV right now? Don't do it. Play the simple, baby. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, you know, this, the thing I tell people to do, do is like think about all the scenarios. Mm-hmm. Make sure your mental health is in great, great place. Yeah. Um, understand that your entire structure of your day, which you don't even know you have sometimes, um, is going to be completely disrupted, which is going to impact your wellness, mm-hmm. right? Make sure you're you're capable of being resilient. Make sure you're confident in yourself and what you do so you don't get um, you know, put in any situations where you act out of character. And I think that that's a lot to ask of the people that they usually you know, want to have on yeah. these shows because they, they want to have people that are reactive. They want to have people they can push, that they can pump full of, you know, alcohol or whatever mm-hmm. it is. And so I just think people, um, you know, I advise them like 
really do a self-assessment and see where you are yeah. and understand that even though you're good now, a lot of that has to probably do with the structure in your life, with going to work, seeing friends, seeing yes. family, spending time reading, spending time on walks, like my case. Mm. All of that's gone. Yep. Mm. So just try as hard as you can to cover all your bases and know how you're going to um, keep your your yourself sharp in the wow. thing. And be That's willing amazing. to walk away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Be willing to walk away. Don't force it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's beautiful advice, man. Man, yeah. my man, thank you so much for the time, man. Thank I really appreciate you, you coming on. Thank you. This is beautiful, man. I'm so grateful for you guys having me on. I, I really am. Um, one one last thing, can I say? Cool. Oh, cool. I started a petition. Yes. I saw uh, that. With with move on. Okay. Move on dot org slash reality. And this is to ask Netflix and all reality productions to put a disclaimer yep. on every single episode. And that disclaimer, give me a second. I'm going to pull up exactly what it says, if you don't mind. And this is important because this show does ruin people's lives, especially when you get that edit, right? And you're not sure and you don't know it until it comes out and you watch it for yourself. Yep. So um, the petition is to have a uh, disclaimer put and that is going to say that episodes are for entertainment purposes only and the content can be edited manipulated and presented in any order for storyline purposes so we just want that to flash on a screen at yeah. the beginning of every episode just like if you're watching a show or a movie based on an actual event or actual person yeah. what do we say based on a true story yes. based on accurate events yes. this is based on reality but it's not necessarily 100 percent real yeah. so i think it's only fair that we add this disclaimer to try and protect people uh from the the harsh uh criticisms and realities yeah. of of what the public perception is Love that. wow that's Love beautiful that. man Powerful. thank you so so much man for sharing really really yeah. appreciate it and we'll definitely share that petition around yep. um, my man thank thanks so much you. for your time once again and uh, thanks me yeah we'll talk to you soon yeah thank you guys so much for having me I really do appreciate it cheers Nick thanks